So I want to welcome everyone to the second Division Three Showcase uh, panel of the commencement uh, season organized around our time and narrative learning collaborative. My name is Ava Rushman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a professor of cultural studies here at Hampshire. I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging that we stand on Nanatuck land. And I'd also like to acknowledge the peoples who were historically here and their living descendants and relations, as well as our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west and the Abenaki to the north. So the time and narrative learning collaborative just briefly um, investigates how as communities and cultures, we author time, mark time and measure space and time. The faculty, staff and students who work together in this learning collaborative pursue a range of questions that traverse the fields of literature, history, physics, film, biology, philosophy, music, astronomy, studio arts, and many more. The Learning Collaborative asks such questions as whose histories gets told and whose memories matter? How does the multi-million year history of the earth affect how we think about human evolution, history, knowledge, and the future? How do conceptions of time affect what we create and imagine? How do we experience time during a crisis such as the pandemic that we've all been living through? So as you might know, our learning collaboratives or LCs as we call them here at Hampshire are a new initiative of Hampshire, one just coming into being this year as these students were launching division three projects. And so while in the future, we imagine the learning collaboratives and the division threes as more tightly interwoven, this year, our students present projects that have affinities with these emerging collaborative hubs. So now I'd like to move to the introductions. We have five presenters in our session today. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to present and then five minutes of Q&A. Presenters, when you have two minutes left on your presentation, you will hear a chime from my phone uh, that will give you notice. And at 10 minutes, I'll uh, ask you to wrap it up if you are still talking at that point. And audience members, please put your questions and comments in the chat. Um, I will and you could post comments or, or praise and congratulations, but if you have a question, uh, definitely um, let us know who the question is for and make sure we know it is a question so that then our panelists can respond. So I think without further ado, we'll begin with our first presenter, uh, China Aming. Uh, the title of her Div 3 is Healing Circles, support groups for childhood assault survivors. So China, here you go. Hi everyone, I'm China Ming and this is my presentation, Healing Circle Support Groups for Childhood Sexual Assault Survivors. Before we, why isn't that, sorry, one second. Okay, before we begin, there are a couple terms that you should know. Um, so we're going to start off with childhood sexual assault, also known as CSA, which is the activities involving ch a child under legal age as proved, provided by national law, as well as sexual activities with children involved, involving coercion, abuse of position of trust or influence, or exploitation of a vulnerable or dependent child. Early life stress, also known as ELS, any form of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse and neglect experienced by an individual under the age of 18. Childhood trauma, a traumatic event that threatens injury, death, or physical integrity of self or of, of self of others, and also causes horror, terror, and hopelessness at the time it occurs and overwhelms a person's ability to cope. And adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, which are potentially traumatic events that occur in, the ch in childhood before the age of 18. And so what we have right here are historical contexts that give a background on CSA. And the presence of childhood sexual assault in the United States can be dated back to the 1800s. 
Attempting to understand the cause of CSA, one must examine the social consciousness and general acceptance of CSA within modern society. Attempting to understand the cause of CSA, it has, began to, it has been suggested that backlash, minimization, and denial of CSA are due to cognitive dissonance in which society is uncomfortable with believing the atrocities existing, such as increasing prevalence of CSA. In an attempt to blur these lines between the consensual sex and CSA, Nelson 1989 argues that the child participants are powerless in declining sex with adults and that sex education is needing so that children are aware that they can make more informed decisions surrounding their participation. It is easier to accept CSA if the individual is not perceived as a child and being distinct needs from adults. One reason for this perception may be that children are threatened with severe consequences if they disclose their abuse. Early life stress and brain reasons affected by trauma. The link between early life stress and negative health outcomes stems from the phys physiological responses of the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland, also known as the HPA axis. 65% of people within the United States have experienced at least one adverse experience in their lifespan. Emotional reactivity, functional and structural changes in the brain, circadian rhythm disruption, metabolic dysregulation, and immune dysregulation are all factors that play after experiencing adverse experiences. The body prepares the fight or flight response by the, the peritoneal SNA releasing epinephrine or norepinephrine or increased blood pressure and heart rate. The HPA axis releases a corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which releases a hormone cortisol in the receptors of the pituitary gland. High levels of hormones can impair the prefrontal cortex, limiting rational thought, organization, and planning. Constant stress can alter homeostasis of the body depending on the individual's perception or severity of the stressor that can lead to behavioral and physiological responses. Childhood is a critical time for the amygdala, and exposing it to early life stress can affect the processing of information into memories and affect, affect emotional aspects attached to it. Factors including sex, genetic background, the age of exposure, the age and context in which the long-term impact happen are all things that need to be examined. And so with that, you wonder, how do we get to childhood trauma and adversity? Rarely childhood trauma occurs in just a single event. Frequency is a major factor, including persistent abuse involving one or more bad experience. In many cases, negative risk factors, including poverty, parental neglect, or drug abuse coexist with the multiple chronic stressors and in return can cause disease and health risks within the adulthood. When the outcome of trauma is explained by exposure to more than one adversity, it is called adverse childhood experiences. And Average Childhood Experiences was coined in 1995 by Ro researcher Robert Anda, who conducted the ACE study, which found that individuals who reported one or more ACEs can have a dose response between their ACEs and risk behaviors, meaning that the more ACEs that you have or you identify, the more likely you are to experience negative and physical, mental and physical and mental health outcomes. Some of these outcomes include immediate chromosomal damage, changes to brain function during development, PTSD, ADHD, COPD, and even cancer. Research shows that ACEs were more prevalent in low income and minority populations due to the imbalances of trauma, racial and socioeconomic pressures, and factors that are due to increased reduction of life. In addition to living in environments with unhealthy behaviors, when it's combined with ACEs, it increases vulnerability and reduction of executive function. Adaptation to environments at early stages are critical to development. And if these adaptations are constant sense of fight or flight, it results in severity of biological processes like the immune and nervous system. Childhood sexual assault is just one category under ACEs, but in some cases it can be presented as the most detrimental to healing and development of children into adulthood. Since the term that we call child does not have a single classification or definition, there is no way to determine the exact number of children who are affected by childhood sexual assault annually. A child's cognitive approach and affected state is, disori is disoriented when childhood sexual assault alters their self-conception and worldview. According to the 1985 study by Finkel and Brown, four factors are necessary when we are analyzing and addressing childhood sexual assault. The first factor is traumatic sexualization, also known as sexuality form in developmentally inappropriate ways. The second is stigmatization, also known as shame and guilt. The third is betrayal of trust and vulnerability manipulation. And the last is powerlessness and the inability to protect oneself. When we have disassociative symptom 
symptomology marked by denying sexual abuse events, rapid changes in personality, rapid regression in behavior and academics, frequent daydreaming and in inappropriate sexual knowledge or behaviors, it is evident that childhood sexual assault may have been prevailed. And so sexual assault, as many other processes of fight or flight, have neurobiological implications. And so during this time, the catecholamines are increased damaging memories and impaired rational thought. Opioids increase, causing flat effect, and corticosteroids increase, decrease reducing energy and impair immune functioning. Survivors of sexual assault report the inability to logically plan steps needed to defend themselves from traumatic events in addition to the flight or flight. These traumatic events elicit the toxic immobility. And toxic immobility is a rape-induced paralysis, which is related to the mammalian response in extremely fearful situations, which increases breathing, eye closures, and paralysis. 12 to 15% of these survivors experience toxic immobility during assault and more common in individuals who have been assaulted in childhood or adolescence. So if we are in defenses of hypervigilance or fight or flight and toxic tonic immobility is not viable, the body transitions into the final defense state, which is known as the freeze or the collapse state. And in this state, the body prepares a person for injury or death by releasing, releasing opioids to decrease pain. After sexual assault, survivors report emotions of detachment and often confused with apathy or indifference. Within this body, the glucocorticoids and the catalonamine levels are extremely high and memory retrieval is impaired. However, it is important to note that experiencing memories in high emotional intensity can enhance decoding and develop more salient traumatic memory. And so when we go through these situations or survivors go through these situations, it is necessary for them to have social support. In childhood, early relationships are vital for protection of children. And children who experience childhood sexual assault have a hindered internalized interpersonal structures like attachment. This can cause a result of hyperactivity attempting to achieve support, care and love in order to regulate distress and deactivate attempts such as the denial of attachment and suppression of emotions to thought. This in return can reflect into re-victimization which is defined as an individual with a history of CSA having assault again between adolescents and adults. Research shows that CSA can increase the risk of sexual victimization and those who recover from it struggle with intense feelings of negative emotion, increasing social isolation and undermining the establishment or continuation of meaningful relationships. These belief systems are conceptualized by three primary areas. People are good, helpful, and kind. Societal assumptions like people get what they deserve and belief upon oneself on self-perception of people as good or worthy. When changing old self-beliefs and accepting and connecting the impact of assault, developing a kinder interpersonal relationship and changing self-views has been reported as an important process to healing from childhood sexual assault. There are a range of support groups formats, including self-help groups, online support groups, support survivor groups led by therapists, and crisis-oriented support, support groups. These support groups appear to include educational, therapeutic, and skill development components, furnish mutual support through participants, and often adaptive coping strategies seeking to reduce isolation and create a sense of belonging. However, while these support providers are interacting every day with survivors of childhood sexual assault, it can be a struggle to provide the resource intensive services which survivors require. And so this is where my study comes. And this current study examines the effectiveness of support groups through the eyes of childhood sexual assault survivors. This study is sought to understand how support groups effectiveness in discussing topics surrounding intimacy, self-compassion, sexuality, and justice prevail. And so my primary questions were, how effective are support groups effect in discussing themes of intimacy, self-compassion, sexuality, and justice? Which activities are most helpful within sessions, which are least helpful and why? What suggestions do you have to better improve these services? How do your feelings around the, the social support within your support group affect your willingness to participate? And what advice do you have for these support groups? Would you recommend these services to another survivor? And so right here, we have my demographic information and age questionnaires for my five participants. And all of my participants were over 18, current or recent undergraduate students identified as childhood sexual assault survivors or victims based on how they identified themselves, participated in some form of support group and were between the ages of 20 to 24. 
And prior to these interviews, participants received a demographic questionnaire which requested personal information and prior disclosure reporting and therapy regarding the assault. An ACE questionnaire, which consists of the 10 types of ACEs, including abuse, neglect, and household challenges prior to 18. And a brief mood scale that had a mood adjective, two adjectives that are selected from eight mood states, loving, happy, calm, fearful, angry, energetic, sad, and tired. Once the interviews were commenced, participants were given a brief survey and post-interview mood scales. During the study, they were informed that it would be recorded in audio tape and the interviews lasted between 60 to 90 minutes and were transcribed verbatim. This data was analyzed using an interpretive phenomenological analysis, also known as IPA, which is an approach where each participant's narratives were individually analyzed before generalizations were made to other participants. And so we have some of the results. And all of my participants described their childhood as idyllic, artistic, really, really, really great. However, the negative feeling surrounding their childhood was dark, isolating, and hard, and they were all direct relations to their assault, and it caused a dramatic shift and a turning point within their lives. Three of these participants reported being assaulted at age eight or younger, and two reported being assaulted older than 18. Being that childhood sexual assault is an ACE factor, this in accumulation to their ACEs resulted in heightened feelings of negative emotions. Many of these participants experienced confusion following their assaults and feelings of being lonely to isolated. In addition, it affected their relationships with others and flashbacks of their assault were triggered through physical interactions. Dissociation was also noted within participants and memories were not triggered until a year or more after the assault. Three of these participants expressed that they were closely connected to their perpetrators and found it challenging to disclose this information to family and friends. And when it was disclosed, they were mentioning mixed reactions of desensitizing the act of sexual assault and their support providers were unsympathetic. Sexual assault, sorry. Sexual assault violates individuals' physical boundaries. This violation is tied up with deep feelings of shame and the belief of having no rights in relationships with others, especially men. Some survivors like Avery and Riley discussed the inability to feel as though they had the right to say no to sexual contact after the assault. These participants feared disclosing their assault due to the possibility of being exposed or ridiculed instead of the in information remaining confidential and in return caused them to seek counseling. However, counseling was seek due to the other ACEs, whether that was substance abuse or depression that was in relation to them. And it wasn't until conversation about sexual assault happening within their background that it was noted that these forms of substance abuse or depression were related to their assault, as in negative behaviors in relation to their ACEs. China, if you could wrap it up, that would be great. Okay, cool. So anyways, basically the overall themes that were discussed where societal and social implications weren't included, they were emphasized and diminished pre-existing feelings surrounding their identity after the assault, trauma bonding and survivor stories did not have a positive impact. They were not validated in their experiences, especially those who were part of the LGBT community or were considered black or people of color. And all of these participants explained that these services only focus on cis female survivors. And so they were sexual assault survivors who were children, they were not fitting into that category. So many of them were not able to feel validated. And some of them found the activities cathartic, but others found them, like I said, as trauma bonding. And so simple interventions are that regardless of the type of, type of support groups, these are some consistent challenges to functioning that include repeatedly talking about your problems, the idea of spending a lot of time bonding with others who have the same trauma, inclusivity and positive energy is required to maintain participation, especially those who may not have access. Survivors also said that they did not like to be called survivors or victims, that they preferred first person language, which is present empathetic and followed the atmosphere of the group. There was also a need of direct support as an information to family and friends about the impact of assault, K through 12 education, and that access to support groups should be community-based organizations and media to provide information of access. And many of these survivors asked space for individuals at higher risk, especially those who are sexually abused and assaulted as children, witness sexual abuse and assault at home, and use substance following their assault and abuse. And that is my presentation. And I would like to thank the people here. Thank you. Thank you so much, China. That was great. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions? Uh, does anyone have comments? Please uh, write them up in the chat.
Um, so Amy asks, do you think it's helpful for survivors to understand the neurochemical impacts of assault? If so, in what way, if not why? Okay, so all of my participants actually had a background in psychology or neuroscience, so they un already understood the neuro implications of assault. However, I think that survivors, those who deal with survivors or anyone who has a direct relation with someone who was affected by childhood sexual assault or abuse should know neurological and chemical implications because like I said, everybody is different, individuals are different and our brains function different. So the way that I think, we may think the same but it may not actually be the same in relation to our brains. And so individuals understanding how other people can react to it based off of differentiation of what we view as a survivor should look like or act like is very so necessary. And so in what way is just people basically being educated and also asking survivors what they want or how they're feeling and validating them in their experiences. Any other questions? Did my diff change throughout my academic year? Yes, it did. Um, so I actually graduated last semester. And so I started my diff three last spring. And originally I was supposed to look at cortisol levels of um, college students who were once in foster care or independent students. And I was tracking to see how their ACEs or exposures of child childhood adversity would affect their participation during final seasons or their workload. Um, and so I was supposed to collect cortisol levels throughout the semester. However, due to COVID, I could not collect cortisol levels anymore. So I was interning with a Hampshire alum, Madison Campbell, on her project, Lita Health. And basically, that's how I came together of my div. And it was based off of what we experienced being part of her research team, but also part of her support group team. Great, we maybe we have time for one more question. Okay, um, yes, I do plan on continue working in this area. I'm going to grad school at Smith College for social work and I am focusing on the sexual abuse to prison pipeline about pushing girls of color out of schools and how that directly relates to um, the sexual abuse to prison pipeline. So um, sex trafficking, human trafficking, um, prostitution, things like that, and them being held as perpetrators instead of perpetrators being accountable of grooming them and the education system pushing them out. Um, and I think that was everybody's question. And yes, it was difficult finding interviews and getting responses considering the fact that the point of confidentiality and making sure that everybody feels confidential and validated in their experiences. And thank you guys for your questions and listening to my presentation. Thank you, China. That was really interesting. Uh, let's uh, go to our third presenter, Daniela Figueroa. And uh, the title of the Division Three is On the Soul and the Psyche, an interactive chapbook exploring the intersections of introspective expression. Hi everyone, is that showing okay, Ava? Yes, it is, yeah, um, you're fine. Thank you, um, I'm gonna turn my video off. <laughs> um, so my div is entitled On the Soul and the Psyche and it's an interactive chapbook exploring the intersections of introspective expression. Um, these intersections for me are from my studies of psychology and psychoanalysis um, along with creative writing and painting, um, which is, you know, visual art in general, and then for creative writing, um, poetry, of course. Um, really regarding the idea that our unconscious thoughts and desires are inevitably imbued into the work that we create and can be used as tools for self-discovery and expression. So this is my forward, my invitation to the reader to embark on this journey. Um, this idea began by, at first I wanted to create a chapbook that presented my poems and their coinciding paintings. However, I thought that that wasn't enough and I would be doing a disservice if I didn't extend this invitation that you know, I created for myself and 
an invitation to have people do the same thing and feel better. <laughs> and of course, I have an invitation on the side for the reader to draw in the book as they please and what else are margins for. Um, and this comes from my own experience with never writing <laughs> in my books. Um, even if I own them, I really didn't like it. I really thought that it was really disrespecting <laughs> the work. And then, you know, obviously I've come to realize that that is the only way to truly engage with the work and be fully present with the writer and the speaker. So this is the second poem that comes up in the book um, and it's entitled, Shit We Just Don't Talk About. Um, this poem is inspired and adapted from Heather McGue's What He Thought. Um, a little bit about the book construction. Um, I realized that not every painting had a poem um, and not every, you know, and vice versa. Um, and therefore I decided for every poem that doesn't have a painting, they will have a larger, interactive section for the reader to engage with and with intentional spaces for the reader to put their thoughts, drawings, whatever they see fit. So this is the first part of the prompt. Um, have you ever been told not to talk about something, maybe something others have overcompensated for? How has it affected you or those around you? And draw yourself saying something you were told not to talk about. Um, and yeah, so there's a space for the reader to draw themselves however they want. And with little like a little hit saying to try and fill the speech bubble as much as you can, whether it be with the drawings, writing, you know, big bubble text, you know, anything that, you know, anything that works. Um, and then the second part is a full spread of different text bubbles. Um, yeah, to include other things that, you know, you've been told not to talk about. Um, these drawings are actually hand drawn in my sketchbook. <laughs> and I decided to scan them in because I really, I feel like it shows how, how I draw and how I doodle within my own journaling practices and really, you know, communicating that handmade quality and that process um, that nothing has to be perfect because, you know, if I copy pasted shapes, all the shapes from, you know, Word and PowerPoint, I just feel like that wasn't, that wasn't enough. And I don't expect the reader to be perfect in their responses. So why would I be perfect in my own? This is another poem that is included. Um, also, these are some of my shorter poems, um, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and for this poem, um, this poem does have a painting. However, with the pictures that I ended up taking of my paintings, I decided to only include close-ups and pick pieces of the paintings instead of giving away the full image throughout the book to enact the, the process like feel, since I'm not asking the reader to, you know, provide their own complete image, um, just, you know, pieces of hinting of how we can start bridging those two things together. And, and this is the prompt that goes with that one. And it's what is something you have reconciled with or want to reconcile with? And what color does your truth shine? Um, with the instruction to fill the outline with colors of your choice, but of course there's space to color, write and draw all around as the reader sees fit. These are examples of how the full painting images appear at the end of the book. They have their own section. Um, and yeah, they have their own section. So when the reader is done with, you know, their journey, they can see, oh, wow, this actually is, this may provide, you know, a more complete image. Um, and these are some more examples. I didn't want to provide too many examples and give away all the content, but I hope I have, you know, provided enough examples um, to intrigue everyone that's looking. 
And this is just an image of the book in my hand. And you can actually scan the link to purchase my chapbook um, at blurb.com, of course. Um, and yeah, I would like to leave off with the message that, you know, some people would say that the soul and the psyche are one and the same, but my chapbook proves that I beg to differ. So I hope you will all, you know, look at this book and hopefully embark on your own journey of self-discovery and self-expression. Thank you so much, Daniela. This is, looks like a, a book that a lot of people would be interested to work with. So thank you so much for all your work on this. Um, again, if people have questions or would like to post more comments, please go ahead. The question is, this project invites the reader to be vulnerable and open. Is there a poem that most challenged your own openness and vulnerability? Um, all of them. <laughs> um, thank you, Nathan, for that question. Um, but yes, no, I definitely think a lot of my poems um, are really, really vulnerable. And that's why I felt you know, at that disservice of sharing my own journey of introspection, because what does that mean to anyone else? But I kind of wanted to show like, well, you know, this is what I've learned for myself. And even though I was very afraid to do it, I have had to learn to overcome that. And so, yes, a lot of vulnerability. Um, what is my favorite poem and why? What is my favorite poem? Let me check. I have a copy right here. Oh, you can't see a virtual background. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm going to I'm going to check what is my favorite poem. Um, I have a few favorites. Um, my newest favorite is a long poem that I wrote called I don't want to write about COVID. And it's about everything that's been happening during COVID, even though I don't want to write about it. Um, and my second favorite is a poem entitled Why My Heart Has Renamed Itself Commitment Issues, um, and that it's a long poem, a very long poem. <laughs> yes, I can share the code and I can put the link in the chat. Um, the book is technically, so I was thinking of other guided journals um, that like, you know, that you see in the store all the time. I know like a new one that came out was Heart Talk and, you know, there's Start Where You Are um, and thinking about journals like Wreck This Journal. And it's like, you know, with those journals, you don't, it is almost meant to be like a diary, like a journal, um, very personal. Um, you can share it with others by all means. I'm sharing, you know, that vulnerable aspect. I am sharing that with the world. I'm sharing that with everybody. Um, however, you know, that's totally, it is open to interpretation. You can interpret it however you want. Um, but in my eyes, I do think that a lot of my work began, like I said, as just introspective tools for introspection. Um, so I really do think that, yeah, so it is very personal. It is very private. So it's up to you whether you want those to be shared. It's just, you know, telling the reader that if you can't say it out loud, there is a place for that and it can be kept with you and secure and make you feel better for the fact that you let it out and you didn't hold it in. I hope that answers your question, Allison. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela, uh, and congratulations again on your project. Um, we have two more presenters, uh, so I think I'd like to move on to Olivia Caldwell. Um, her, their div three is called Misfit, a Manuscript of Poetry and Cyanotype Images. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm not, I think, as exciting as everyone else. I'm not giving you anything to look at, but um, you can look at me and listen to my poems. Um, and I've put together a horribly scrawled list of poems that I'm going to read for you. Um, so yeah, just throw, throw comments, questions as we go. Um, yeah. So 
can can everybody hear me fine um thumbs i see a thumb maybe okay um all right so the first poem that i'm going to read for you is the um the title poem of my collection which is and not the title poem sorry the first poem in the collection which is titled the summit the summit it's all small horizon of land expanse of hills and farm and jutting white homes the trees wrinkled too early uncomfortable like a blaze ready or waiting i must look recently back from the dead clothes pulled from the laundry pile a casing new skin we pretend to ignore the crisp of things the uneasiness of tufted grass nothing is as it should be anymore i'm parched tongue thick and sticky. It pulls from the roof of my mouth. I'll keep it pressed there, my own twisted thinking face, just a little longer. So the next poem that I'm gonna read is called On Inheritance. It's funny, things that manifest ugly and unseen, the pieces that know without. Sometimes I forget if I made up all my memories, if I ever tasted eggs and ketchup. Did you hold my hand, tuck me into bed? My face is my face, is your face, and I don't know what we look like. But still, I am brown hair, eyes, summer skin, foot shaker, light switch slapper. On the couch, my right foot dances in my mother's lap, anxious tick. Every time, God, she says, you're just like your father. It's just funny to read because I know she's, she's watching and probably laughing. So the next poem is the title poem of the collection. Uh, it's titled Misfit. Oh, and this is a duplex. Um, if anybody knows anything about that or wants to look that up. It's a pretty cool uh, form of poetry. And it was my first duplex, so <laughs> hopefully successful. Misfit. I didn't quite fit in the frame. I needed to adjust the camera back farther against the pink chair, the cat, some socks, a pile in the pink chair. I posed myself intimate, crouched on the bed the way I once hid from monsters there, that same bed. I hid from the panic, but it bubbled in my chest. I felt it, felt nothing, always bubbling in my chest. Squeezing the shutter, the tripod shook, again and again, posed still until I shook. Self-portraits of the poet, her body always in pieces, unclear, a blurred image, still life in pieces. The film advances, move along anyway, mistake, Misfit, the pressure so low, so full of mistakes. After, I search the picture, see what doesn't fit in the frame. And next is, and when the deer hit my trunk. And when the deer hit my trunk, she, all hoof, blood and fur, my legs went jello soft and skin prickly. Still, the music played, the directional blinked, clicked like a clock as if to say, nothing had happened here, just passing time. Then came the nausea, numb relief, adrenaline, flashing lights smiling from behind, slow down neighbor, things are passing by too fast and your hazards are on. I wonder if she made a sound, an oof, some intake of breath and bleat, Maybe her nose flared while stumbling over stone feet. I'm glad I didn't hear it. I saw her happen, hesitation, commitment, the breaking. I saw her choose movement on Tuesday, a little loss. And then next is in the frame at the top of the stairs, um, just a little story about this one. I have not stopped thinking about this since I turned in my div in November. Uh, this is probably the third or fourth iteration that has happened. Um, I actually sent this off to Nathan, uh, who was my advisor, chair, 
mentor basically um, in the chat somewhere. Uh, I sent it off to him about an hour ago and said, hey, do you, can you look at this? Because uh, I am I'm nervous about reading it. Um, and he gave me some, some feedback. Of course, I didn't have enough time to use the feedback, but um, so this one is still in the works, I'll say. So in the frame at the top of the stairs. They are smiling with teeth, stark white, lips parted and wet with excitement, the freshness of being in love. Happy marriage punctuated with this, white rice falling from the sky. A pretty picture. The flash bellows itself, freezes delicate my grandmother who made a white wedding dress with small fingers and cups of tea between algebra quiz and red smearing pen. A spring in Ohio, kneecap snow melting in dreams and cracked pavement sprouting grass, planning a summer wedding, the sleeves dripping in lace and beads. I sit in the spring some 50 years later, picture myself in that same dress, rich tones of olive skin and tattoos, softly blurred the way I once opened gifts wrapped in tissue paper. I knew what they were before I could see. Their giddy faces live in my head, punctuated with white petals, so young and still so sure. Uh, next, I have summer pastoral. The fog branches in, snakes itself around my socked feet like a daydream. Morning dew collects tiny galaxies in the tiger lilies, their oranges aflame, dripping ashen embers into soft grass. Their fingers are beckoning, intoxicating. Listen, come closer. I am quiet, but the lilies are shrieking. Can't you hear them too? Now I have a happy one. Crazy, I know. Um, this is Campfire Story. If I ever get the chance to have a family, I want to buy a big Winnebago to hitch to the back of my SUV. Let me wake up beneath the evergreens, sweep dust from the camper and spend mornings watching the sunrise over the treetops in the mountains while blueberry pancakes sputter away on the fire's griddle. My feet will always be dirty, clothes smelling of syrup and smoke. It will be good, even the rain, even the birds and the bears will be smiling. If I ever get the chance to have a family, we will live as happy people do. And then my final poem, which is also the final poem of the collection, um, called, I spent a year fat and happy. I woke each morning with no obligations, stretched and hugged myself tight around the middle. Breakfast came with no lefter, leftovers, anything I wanted, no pills. I sipped coffee in the rocking chair and never felt the fluttering, never felt too hot or too cold. I read so many books, my focus not a question. There was no pain that year, no fear. It was like a rebirth. My life became something fly-eyed and new. Oh, and the best part, I wrote. I wrote and I sang and I loved and I cried for good. It was good. And those are my poems. Thank you so much, Olivia. Beautiful poetry. Um, I think we have some time for some questions and I see Nathan McLean has a question in the Q&A about perception and its role in your poetry. Okay. So it says, perception is obviously important in your work. The photographer's eye, how the self is viewed by others and the self, what your speaker looks at, etc. Could you talk a bit more about the role of perception as you see it and how it continues to inform your work? Oh boy. Um, yeah, perception is something, huh? Um, it, perception will always inform my work. I'm very much a person who spends a lot of time sitting and thinking and listening and observing um, and looking. That's something that comes up a lot. I, I do a lot of photography. Um, it was part of my div, part of my time at Hampshire. Um, so observation and filtering everything kind of through myself and my own lens 
um, is kind of how I process the world and how I process everything. Anyone who knows me will know that I will sit there and talk and talk and talk in order to figure things out. Um, so it makes sense that I would write and write and write <laughs> um, and make it sound as nice as I can. So um, I guess that's kind of my, my thoughts on perception. I, I've been really enjoying um, trying to step out of my own perception in my writing um, and thinking about even taking on personas and things like that because I've seen a lot of really excellent work and um, stuff come from things like that. So um, there, there's a poem in the collection that originally began, began as a persona poem um, from uh, like the perspective of a deer, which I write a lot about and I actually read some about. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's something I think about a lot. So um, yeah, hope that answers. I don't know, Nathan always comes in with the hard questions for me, so. <laughs> Maybe we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. If there is one. Um, I see lots of comments. Thank you everybody for your very nice words. Um, and also congratulations to everybody else who's here and finishing up and it's crazy stuff that we did. <laughs> crazy time that we did it in, uh, pretty cool. I think there's one more question about uh, any poets or authors that influence you. Oh, um, lots of people. Um, man, right next to me, this is going to be really cheesy, but the two books that I have right next to me are Nathan's book, Scale, his first collection, uh, second collection coming very soon, check it out. Um, and Contemporary American Poetry by John Murillo, who used to work here at Hampshire and is uh, probably my other mentor <laughs> that I've spent a lot of time working with. Um, man, I got John's other book right here. Um, I really love uh, Look by Solma Sharif. This is probably the book that I recommend to everybody. Um, I don't know, I just really love Poetry, I'm really most inspired by a lot of the people that I work with, a lot of the people around me. So, um, and most of them are Hampshire students, Hampshire poets and Hampshire alumni. So yeah, I don't know. It, it's fun to be able to speak to other people about poetry um, and get direct feedback from the people around you. So that's really who, who inspires me. <laughs> Great. Well. We have one more presenter, um, and this is Andrew Sapini. Uh, the Div 3 is History of the Emergency Medical Service uh, in a Collection of Paintings. Uh, share my screen. All right, so yes, I'm Andrew. I am an EMT at Hampshire College. I'm sure y'all know me from the testing site. Um, I'm also an EMT in New York City, uh, but I also have been doing a lot of painting all my four years here. And I also really love history and I wanted to find a way to combine them all. So I created my dip on the history of the emergency medical service. Um, it's the history of EMS isn't talked about that much. Um, and it's a very interesting history and we've progressed a really long, a lot. Um, but then we also have a lot more we can do. There's still so many problems in EMS. So it's still very much a problematic racist institution. Um, but it's, I just wanted to show like, just how far we've come and what we can do to keep improving it. Um, so to start off, 
Um, these are also all oil on canvas. Uh, I created a painting of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, this is considered to be the beginning of the emergency medical service. Um, Napoleon's surgeon, uh, Jean Larry, he created these things known as flying ambulances. Um, they were able to take patients off the battlefield and to field hospitals much faster than anyone was doing before. And not only that, he created the modern system of triage, categorizing his patients from mortally wounded, minorly wounded, and surgical cases. Um, and this was able to save a lot of lives and triage is still very much still used today. And so, yeah, this is what is considered to be the beginning. And the next painting I chose to make was of Bellevue Hospital. Um, in New York City, they created their own ambulance. Um, it was based off of Civil War ambulances, but these ones had doctors that rode with them and they were basically the first actually successful municipal ambulance service. And they would show up and they would treat patients on scene and carry them to the hospital. Because before they were just using ambulances that were, it wasn't even really ambulances, just sort of horse-drawn carriages run by the police. Um, but these ambulances were actual ambulances and the system that they created took off and expanded to other cities and Bellevue Hospital still exists and the ambulance station right next to it still exists. Um, this is World War One. Um, I chose this one because there's just a lot of innovation that happened during World War I. Um, that's when people started to shift from horse-drawn ambulances to motorized ambulances. And people got better at treating injuries. A notable example of that is the traction splint, which is what's on the soldier's leg. Um, when, if you break your femur, um, the bones can sometimes hit into blood vessels and the muscle also contracts around it and it can cause a lot of problems. And uh, before this thing was invented, the mortality rate for femur fractures was 80% in 1916. But then in 1918, with this thing, it was down to 20%. And we still use them today. And so yeah, then it's basically, this wartime innovation continued in World War I and World War II. And as the soldiers returned home, they brought their innovations back with them. And so this is a 1960s ambulance. Um, and this time, most of the ambulances were run by funeral homes. Uh, which was not the best. They really only had to have a first aid level training. And even that was more of a strong suggestion than actual requirement. And they, they used hearses because, you know, you could lie down flat in them. And if you died, you could still be able to go to the funeral home. The, so they made money either way. Um, but to deal with this, um, they created this, um, this uh, the National Institute on Shock and Trauma created a thing known as the White Papers, which basically outlined all the problems with the emergency medical service and basically created all these lists of improvements, including like including the hospitals, including um, dispatch, and basically, made EMTs actually become actual EMTs. They didn't just drive ambulances, they actually actively participate in patient care and actively tried to stop 
death on scene and in route. And this was, this ended up saving a lot of lives, um, especially on highways when people are crashing their cars without seatbelts. And so this is the 70s. Um, this is what's known as Freedom House Ambulance. They were some, they were in Pittsburgh, um, in Pittsburgh Hill District. Uh, it was a very segregated neighborhood. Um, it was a very poor neighborhood. And the people that were living there, they, if they needed an ambulance, they would have to call the police. And obviously the police are not very good at well, just in general, not good with treating patients, but especially uh, patients of color. Um, and so to deal with this, they created their own ambulance service. Um, it was originally just created as an employment opportunity, but then uh, this guy known as Peter Sapphire, the father of CPR, he came and he basically was like, we're going to make this ambulance service better than all the other ambulance services. We're gonna give you way more training, um, have you do clinical rotations and have all these new equipment and we're gonna make you way better than everyone else. Um, and they, they did, they became the best EMTs in Pittsburgh. Um, the police didn't like them, but they would just listen to the police radios and show up to calls before the police did and steal the patients. Um, and then later this woman, Nancy Caroline joined them and she was a doctor who taught them all kinds of skills never before seen in the pre-hospital setting like EKGs, defibrillation, uh, intubation, just all the stuff that was usually only done in hospitals. And so this basically became when ambulances were mobile ERs. And this is um, the CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon. They are sort of a mental health first responders. Um, they are basically they help, they respond to calls, mental health calls instead of the police and also respond to just all kinds of various crises and people who are houseless. And they're just a good alternative resources and shows, and they basically show how like social workers and paramedics can work together and respond to calls instead of the more traditional EMTs. And this is, uh, this is more modern to like, this is happening right now. Uh, this is ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Um, it's basically them, if your heart stops, they can take your blood out, oxygenate it and put it back in. But in order to do that, they have to cut into your femoral artery, uh, which requires basically surgery, um, but now they could do it in the street or wherever you are, you don't have to do it in the hospital. And so basically the team is dispatched and works alongside the paramedics on scene and helps to stabilize the patient before moving them on to the hospital. And this is of course COVID, um, this is a New York City triage tent, uh, this is based off of what I remember from it when I was there last summer. Um, yeah, basically just triaging the massive flood of patients that were coming in. So there was a lot of them. And lastly, we have the street medics. Um, I just wanted to include them because even though they aren't like traditional standard, like EMS, they are, they're, they are still a valuable part of patient care and show how like individual people can use their skills to treat patients 
uh, in a non-traditional way. Uh, and these people are nurses, EMTs, or just people who've gone through a street medic training class uh, to help protesters, um, but also just generally people um, who need the medical care and who've been neglected by the healthcare system. And yeah, they are way better at treating protesters than um, normal EMTs and ambulances. And that's basically my presentation. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing your creative work. It's really great. Thank you. I think there are a couple of questions for you um, in the Q&A box. Cahoots. Um, okay. Uh, did learning this history change your practices or philosophy as an EMT? Um, I'd say it did. It definitely made me uh, appreciate it, the history more, and see how far we've come. Um, I'd say definitely learning more about the cahoots and um, that stuff basically did like um, help me think more about like how can we find more creative solutions to help um, underserved communities and because EMTs are they are sort of like stuck in their own old, old ways they don't like to change very much uh, so it's nice to see like a new alternative form of it and cahoots is still active and there are many programs popping up uh, like them all around the country uh, new york city is starting something like it okay any final questions Make sure to come to testing on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to all of our five presenters. This this what it was a wonderful lineup, and actually, I see a lot of connection between all five presentations that I think deal with trauma in one way or another, uh, physical, emotional, psychological, and the the kinds of um, approaches to to mitigating that or, or or coping with it and not just individually but also as a community if we had more time we could you know tease out those kinds of connections which i think are really interesting but alas i think our our next panel is almost upon us so again i want to thank all five of you for all the work you did on your div three for doing really fantastic uh presentations and thank you all for coming and listening um and writing good comments and questions in our chat box. So thank you again for joining this panel.